Hello, everyone. We're going to start our next uh, session now. We've had a, a great start this morning, and I'm very pleased uh, to be able to move on now. We're looking from crisis to actual division, but um, just a couple of uh, announcements. First of all, we're very sorry that Leanne Lane is ill and won't be with us. And uh, it leaves a bit of a gap, I have to say, in terms of the coverage that we, we had planned today, because Leanne would have spoken about women and the divisions and the treaty and the different um, positions that women took from the Kuman Amman split to the development of Saoirse Amman. Um, Leanne at the moment is completing her biography of Mary McSweeney. She, so she would have given us a, a great additional insight. So I want to acknowledge that before we start. And because we have two speakers rather than three, we're planning on leaving, uh, to finishing at one o'clock to give us a little bit more time to go down to Botanic Avenue, um, uh, grab some, uh, a bite to eat and, and, and be back again. So I'm pleased with the two speakers that we have um, this morning. We're going to start off with Daddy O'Coroin, who is the, um, the co-writer of the uh, very acclaimed biography of Cahal Brewer. And we've already had his um, co-writer this morning, um, Jared Hanley. So Dahi is, um, as you can see from the biography, also a co-author of The Dead of the Irish Revolution and has worked on the um, Four Courts Press uh, collection as well. So very pleased to hear Dahi now talking about Cahill Brewer, not the one-dimensional figure we often have, but somebody who, in all his complexities, so um, we've got custodian of the Republic, but no warmonger. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Margaret, and good morning, everyone. Um, in, in terms of the theme of this panel on division, and I haven't said this to Margaret yet, um, but I, I'm going to adopt a somewhat heretical stance by arguing that Brewer, as opposed to the stereotypes of Brewer, does not really belong in this panel at all. Uh, and we can see if you agree with me uh, at, at the end. Now, on the 7th of July, 1922, Brewer became the first high-profile fatality of the Irish Civil War. Within seven weeks, he was joined in death by Harry Boland, Arthur Griffith, and Michael Collins. All were significant figures in the Irish Revolution. Brewer and Boland opposed the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1921 and took the Republican side in the Civil War. Griffith and Collins were the most prominent members of the, the Irish delegation that negotiated the terms of settlement with Britain and vigorously defended it. Of the four figures, Collins has attracted the most interest from writers, historians, filmmakers like my co-panelist Morris uh, and commentators of all kinds. Boland and Griffith have also been the subject of several studies. But by some distance, Brewer has been the most neglected of the quartet, a sort of leading personality also ran. Uh, this is despite him being a member of the Gaelic League, the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Irish Volunteers, a celebrated survivor of the 1916 Rising, um, a crucial figure in the post-Rising reorganisation of the Volunteers and Sinn Féin, speaker at the first sitting of Thal Éireann, and president uh, pro tempore uh, until Eamon de Valera's return in April 1919. That, of course, is not all. He was also Minister for Defence in the underground Dáil government during the War of Independence, a passionate and acerbic opponent of the treaty, and a most reluctant participant in the civil war, having tried to prevent it. Three reasons may be advanced for Brewer's relative neglect by historians. The first, uh, and one that posed significant difficulties for myself and uh, Jerry Handley, was that he left very little by way of personal papers. Uh, one consequence of this has been uh, the production of a very stilted view of Brewer as a soldier. And there's perhaps only one kind of caveat or exception, and that was Brewer's fractious relationship with Michael Collins between 1920 
1921. This has attracted considerable commentary, but largely from the perspective of Michael Collins rather than from the perspective uh, of uh, both men. Now, in this regard, Brewer's furious contribution uh, to Cabinet meetings in December 1921 and during the subsequent treaty debates damaged his reputation at the time and has shaped subsequent perceptions of him as a figure who promoted division. A second reason lies in Brewer's personality. A reticent, reserved and stubborn man, he was not a flamboyant or a charismatic figure like Boland or Collins. Among his contemporaries, Brewer was a figure more respected than loved. Third, and relatedly, that sense of regard was due to Brewer's extraordinary physical courage and his resolute and lifelong pursuit of an Irish Republic. In 1919, uh, Brewer remarked prophetically as it transpired that, quote, the death he would like to die would be fighting for the Republic, end of quote. When that wish was granted, or when that wish transpired uh, in July 1922, the Irish Times produced an especially biting obituary, and I just want to read some of it for you. Of all Ireland's many extremists, he was the most extreme. The manner of his death was typical of his life. Cahill Brewer died as he lived, in the last ditch. All his life, he hated England with an intensity of feeling which is rarely found even in this country of painful memories. Whenever there was talk of a rebellion, he was at the he head of the insurgent movement. Whenever there was talk of surrender, he was found fighting to the last." End of quote. Now, while this uh, obituary captured Brewer's noted tenacity, it ascribed to him a simplistic extremism. Ever since, this view has dominated how, his, how he has been portrayed and how he has been remembered. Far from being at the head of an insurgency in 1922 or a promoter of division, Brewer was actually horrified at the prospect uh, and then the actuality of civil war. The Dáil's approval of the treaty on the 7th of January 1922 represented a shattering uh, blow and a shattering defeat for Brewer because it disestablished the pursuit of a republic uh, which had been the governing thesis of his life. Now, that Dáil vote did not mean, however, that he disregarded the decision of the Dáil, as suggested uh, in a recent RTE documentary. As the outgoing Minister for Defence, he pledged that the IRA would remain faithful to the Dáil's decision. After the treaty split, Brewer remained loyal to de Valera, and he was a convert to the concept of external association as a means of reconciling the demands of British imperialism and Irish nationalism. In the six months prior to the June 1922 election, Brewer had two principal aims. The first was to convince the Irish public that they should be citizens of an Irish republic rather than subjects of a British dominion. Now, ultimately, at the election, uh, the uh, electorate backed the treaty position. The second goal was to prevent the treaty split culminating in civil war. Brewer strongly endorsed the adjournment of the Sinn Féin Ardesh in February 1922 to avoid any damaging division over the treaty. A great deal rested on the nature of the constitution that was being drafted during the first half of 1922. Brewer feared, correctly, that the British government would reject any constitution that was deemed too republican in tone. Notes in his hand revealed his concern that even a favourable general election result might not be enough to cool the hotheads in the anti-treaty IRA. Brewer himself tried to restrain the more bellicose Republicans, but he was given no hearing at the IRA convention in March-April 1922. In fact, this prompted uh, Sean T. O'Kelly to remark to a friend in Rome, and I quote, they did not even think Brewer and Boland good enough uh, fighting men to join them, end of quote. So civilian control then of the army, on which Brewer and de Valera had insisted 
during the War of Independence had now been decisively cast aside. Brewer also repeatedly called for national unity, telling an audience in Waterford in March 1922 that, quote, every effort should be made to achieve unity and maintain it, and almost any concession short of a sacrifice of principle should be made in that direction. When a new Republican organisation, Common the Public, the, was launched in Dublin under the presidency of Eamon de Valera, its chief aims were first uh, the preservation and strengthening of a republic, but also the preservation of the unity of the nation, as they put it. In April, Brewer proposed, and John referred to this uh, in, his, uh, in his paper earlier, uh, Brewer proposed that he and Collins should retire uh, from public life to focus their united efforts uh, on defending beleaguered uh, northern nationalists. Now this sincere, and it was undoubtedly sincere, but unrealistic suggestion was motivated by an intense desire to avoid the abhorrent prospect of fratricidal war. Brewer told the Dáil that he would, quote, prefer to die by an English bullet or an orange bullet, but not one fired by a comrade uh, during the Irish Revolution. In the days before the June uh, 1922 election, Brewer campaigned throughout Waterford, South Kilkenny and South Tipperary. In Waterford City, he very temperately explained that although he continued to disagree with friends, on the opposite side, who claimed the treaty was a step towards a republic, he did not suggest that they were absolutely wrong. So a significant softening um, of Brewer's stance. He was returned as a TD for Waterford County in the June uh, election. Now, although that election was uh, a shattering defeat for Republicans, Brewer took solace in the fact that the guns still remained silent. So why then did Brewer fight in a civil war that he opposed, and what did he hope to achieve? Now the use of British artillery to attack anti-treaty forces um, changed things decisively for Brewer. On the 29th uh, of uh, June 1922, uh, he bid farewell to his wife Kathleen and six children, uh, the youngest of whom was just three months old and the eldest was just nine. So if you're looking at that photograph really carefully, uh, you'll see that that youngest child uh, isn't there because she was not born. This photograph was uh, a few years before uh, the, uh, the, the beginning of the Civil War. Now his departing uh, words to Kathleen um, in Irish bleakly reflected how he had turned out in 1916, and I quote, my heart throbbing with delight at the prospect of striking at the enemy we all knew. I go forth now, scarcely knowing where to I go. Having sought spiritual guidance from a trusted priest, Brewer re-enlisted in the IRA as a private, along with uh, De Valera, Austin Stack, and Robert Barton. He was immediately promoted by Oscar Trainer to staff commandant in charge of a block of buildings on the eastern side of O'Connell Street comprising the Gresham, the Granville, the Crown and the Hammam hotels. When the forecourt garrison surrendered after two days, the National Army then focused their attentions and their weaponry on O'Connell Street, uh, which was the scene of a fierce bombardment. Most of the garrison of 70 men and 30 women were evacuated on the 3rd of July, including de Valera and a majority of what um, in, in future years would become the front bench of Fianna Fáil. Brewer was left in command of a diminished garrison of 17 men and three members of Common Amon. Kathleen Barry, older sister of Kevin Barry and uh, Eunan's uh, grandmother, uh, Linda Cairns and Muriel McSweeney, widow of the late Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney. Brewer's strategy was simple. He wanted to hold out for as long as possible and then surrender without loss of life. Now, the without loss of life part is, is important. So the National Army pounded uh, the IRA position, and you get a better sense of this uh, from the slides uh, you could see here on screen. So the general idea is you fire a shell, at the hotel, you make a breach, and then you drive up 
in your armoured car and you machine gun into, into the breach. So it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty blunt, but it was pretty effective. Um, now, fascinating eyewitness accounts recorded Brewer's concern for the welfare of those under his command, his extraordinary physical courage under fire, and a sense that despite his abhorrence of civil war, he had, in the defence of the Republic, found an inner peace. As defeat and surrender became increasingly likely, Kathleen Barry observed how Brewer, in a pensive mood during a quiet interlude in the fighting, walked up and down, in touch with his own inner thoughts. On his face, she later wrote, a look that made me wonder. Only afterwards I realised that we had been privileged to watch a man making up his mind to immolate himself. Likewise, uh, Linda Kearns, uh, there is Linda, um, Linda Kearns was certain that Brewer himself did not intend to surrender. Before the end, surrounded by fire and in the midst of collapsing masonry, she asked him if he was acting wisely in going to his death as there had been already too many unnecessary deaths. Having considered the question, Brewer replied, civil war is so serious that my death may bring its seriousness home to the Irish people. I feel that if it put a stop to the civil war, it would be a death worthwhile. Now, ultimately, of course, this did not prove so. By the 5th of July, the Republican position had become untenable. There are varying accounts of what happened at the time of the surrender. Cairns described how Brewer had a revolver in each hand and shouted, no surrender. He was struck by a single bullet in the left thigh, which ruptured his femoral artery. Um, most witness accounts state clearly that Brewer did not fire a single shot. He succumbed to his wounds in the Matter Hospital on the 7th of July at the tender age of 47. For him, fidelity to the Irish Republic was sacrosanct. It was a holy mission for which he was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. Now, in Cahal Brewer, an indomitable spirit, uh, Jared Hanley and I challenge the often simplistic and reductive uh, depiction of Brewer as uh, a militant. We use the term indomitable to describe Brewer's uh, republicanism, but this is just as applicable uh, to his wife, Kathleen. Her union with Brewer was not just uh, a meeting of hearts, it's not just um, a love of, of the Irish language uh, and Irish culture, um, but there was also uh, clearly a meeting of Republican minds. She was adamant that no pro-treaty politician would be allowed to attend her husband's funeral uh, in Glasnevin. And there you can, you can see her and her older children there on the graveside. And if you look very closely, you can see um, Sean T. O'Kelly just on the very edge there of the, uh, of the photograph. Um, now, Kathleen uh, was a Republican speaker and fundraiser after Brewer's death, and then she succeeded him as the anti-treaty um, and later Sinn Féin TD for Waterford until September 1927, when Sinn Féin did, did not contest the election due to a lack of funds. And that uh, ended her political uh, career. Now, she never actually sat in Thal Éireann uh, because Sinn Féin pursued an abstentionist policy. Um, she refused financial assistance from the Free State Government. Uh, and this, of course, raised the problem of how she would sustain herself and her six children. And she did this by forging a, a very successful business called Kingston's uh, Men's Outfitters on the site uh, of the former Hammam Hotel. And uh, if you look there, that's just a photograph of O'Connell Street. Um, you can probably just make out Peter Mark hairdresser. That's still there on O'Connell Street. And uh, Kingston's on the corner is now, uh, is now Burger King. Uh, so if you're on O'Connell Street, that's where uh, the clothes shop was, uh, was uh, located. Now, there has been a tendency to reduce Brewer's contribution to the Irish Revolution to a three-act melodrama of heroic uh, defiance in 1916 and in 1922, and furious at ominous attacks on Collins and Griffith for betraying the Republic by signing the Anglo-Irish Treaty and accepting Dominion status. 
Likewise, the memorialization of Brewer, so the naming of the street where he was mortally wounded, the renaming of a military barracks uh, in Rat Mines, uh, and even this, uh, a 24p commemorative stamp featuring Brewer, uh, featuring Brewer in his volunteer uniform issued in 1987, has narrowed the portrayal of Brewer to that of a soldier alone. Brewer was certainly a zealot, so there's no getting away from that fact, and his pursuit of an Irish Republic was certainly uncompromising. His contribution, however, to the Irish Revolution was much greater than is typically realised. After the 1916 Rising, Brewer played a galvanising role in reviving and consolidating the Irish Volunteers in 1917 and in 1918. He was also centrally involved in the reinvention of Sinn Féin from being a marginal political party to the dominant force it became uh, by the time of the election in 1918. He helped to weld together um, disparate nationalist elements under the Sinn Féin banner, with his demands for an Irish Republic and international recognition at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. Through all of this, Brewer stoically defied the effects of his injuries and the constant pain that he endured. So he suffered 25 wounds during the 1916 Rising. He would certainly have died, but for the fact that the garrison that he was fighting in was in the South Dublin Union, and of course there was the, the Union Hospital nearby uh, where medically, uh, emergency medical aid uh, could, be, uh, could be provided. So that sense of pain that he's constantly living with contributed to his dour and irritable demeanour. Now, one of the most acute uh, assessments of Brewer was offered by Owen McNeill in July 1922. Now, um, um, you know, was, was somebody who um, would certainly have been justified if he had given a very negative uh, verdict on Brewer, but that is not what he did. Uh, he deemed Brewer, quote, an honest, honourable, brave and unselfish man and had no doubt that, quote, he was a man who acknowledged the law in his conscience to be supreme in everything, and who, with that in mind, gave his wholehearted allegiance to Ireland, setting his duty to Ireland above life and all the claims and ties and affections that he found in life. What more can be said of any of us? So re to return then to my opening uh, comment about whether Brewer uh, really qualifies for a panel on division, I think once you move uh, beyond the sort of narrow stereotype of Brewer, uh, the question mark uh, that we can put about, uh, around Brewer uh, as, as, a, as a divisive figure, that question mark certainly magnifies in size. Shinna Will, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I think there'll be a good lot of discussion uh, when we come to the discussion. Um, Maurice Sweeney, I'm sure you'll have um, seen some of the films that he's made. He's made so many, as you can see in his biographical details, Michael Collins, Yeats, uh, Dolores Price, etc. What I don't know anything about is his Irish Civil War memory project, and I'm really looking forward now to Morris telling us about them. He says that he has two almost in the can that we'll be yeah. seeing later on um, in 2023. Yeah. So thank you, Morris. Thank, thank Over you. to you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Um, I hate that award-winning director. I don't know if it's written. Um, uh, thank you to Universities Ireland for inviting me here. I'm usually on the other side of the camera, so to speak, so uh, excuse me for any frailties here. So um, the thing as a filmmaker for me um, is when we walk into the area of history, I often feel like an intruder. Uh, you feel like you're trespassing sometimes um, because the nature of filmmaking and often the, what the, the wider public get of history is what we do as filmmakers, and often it's a, redu a redaction of what you guys as historians do, and, and I'm always conscious of that. So what was great about this project uh, was that we weren't beholden to history in a lot of ways, and for what might be horrifying for a lot of people in this room, we weren't, weren't the actual history wasn't that important to us. 
What our project was was two one-hour documentaries to be broadcast by RTE1, which will be in January, February next year, to look at the, how memory was passed on in families uh, of the Civil War from generation to generation. So in many ways, the actual history of what happened, we were not doing a blow-by-blow -blow account, uh, a chronological even uh, detail of what was happening in the Civil War. I know there's another project that RTE are doing that, that is coming out next month, I think. So in a way, we were given a freedom to look at the legacy of civil war and how that was passed on within families. Um, we also had the great chance of working with a lot of historians, not as presenters, but actually collectors, going out and meeting people, uh, what we called the memory keepers of the civil war. Um, Schaefer was one of them, Conor Mulva. And really important in all this was that the, UCD, the folklore department in UCD, in conjunction with Scratch Films and RTE, uh, were able to uh, uh, create this project. And in a sense, the historians weren't there to present a history, but there to ask the memory keepers to give their perception of, of what was going on. Um, as I said, the truth wasn't that important, but what it, did, it gave us the freedom to look at what stayed in the memory of families. Uh, what was important, how, what was that received wisdom through generations and how was it interpreted today. And I suppose rather than me doing too much, I'm going to give you a few clips. Um, so Nathan, if you don't mind just giving the first clip there, I'm going to give you a sense of what the documentary is. So we're still cutting at the moment, so it's a bit rough. So. What effect do you think Tommy's death had on your mum? I think it was the loss of that generation that had an impact on her. She always expressed a sympathy for the effect on the lives of people getting involved in Republican military activity. Results of the inquest are, these words are, I think almost exactly, unlawful killing by persons unknown. Tom was killed not by the troops in Portobello, but by some other unit. And the surmise is that he was killed by an assassination squad from Oriel House. If we look at Collins and what the intelligence department did and the squad did during the War of Independence, it is now being translated to their former friends. They're actually using the same tactics that they used against the British, against their own. You see it in certain pockets of the country, this viciousness. It's a real viciousness that sets in. In Dublin, it is this assassination war. It's tit for tat. And it just descends into this chaos. And it is literally guys getting picked up off the street, in some cases in broad daylight. And in some cases, when these men or boys are next seen, they're dead. They're found, their bodies are found on the outskirts of the sea. And that's the real sort of tragedy of this. Fellas who had survived, what the British couldn't do in 16 and the War of Independence. We do it to ourselves in the first few months of the Civil War. You look at it, Harry Boland, gone. Collins, gone. Cattle Brewer, gone. But all at the hands of their former friends. Liam Tobin, your granddad, is a big name in the War of Independence. He's known as one of Collins' key figures in the intelligence war. Can you tell me about the structure of what becomes known as Oriel House and Liam's involvement? with the whole uh, political sort of policing that happens. Yeah, political policing is a good term because it, it is a murky area to know, is this military, is this police? I think he was in a good position to kind of make a calculation. I can live with this treaty and I can live with what this new space might be. Is it a space to reorganize? Is it a space to rearm? So I don't believe that the treaty was the way in which Liam Tobin thought he's putting the gun down. 
he wanted to set up a kind of a Scotland Yard, a sort of political intelligence organization in Dublin. For Republicans, the name of Royal House means a place of torture, summary executions, just a brutalization of what was happening in the city. Liam Tobin's of a kind of a level where he's making up lists, he's sending out instructions. Instructions are carried out on his order. And that's what civil war is. It's, it's brother against brother, it's friend, close friend against close friend. So that split was been pretty traumatic. He would use the word civil war in inverted commas. He didn't even want to call it that. He didn't know what to call it. Like, what do you call that when you have that kind of level of falling out with someone starts killing each other? Uh, that's just an example of where we use an historian, Liz, uh, collecting memories from a memory keeper. Um, in our early research, um, we often found the, the sense of the fog of war in people's family history. Um, I mean, one example, for instance, when we relate to the CID there, a lot of people, families were convinced that their ancestor relation had been killed by black and tans in the War of Independence. And actually, that was kind of perpetrated within the family memory for a long time. Uh, and it's only later, for instance, that they found out when plaques were put up and, they, and their own research that uh, they were actually killed by CD, CID and their body was dumped on the outskirts of the, the city county boundaries in Dublin. Um, and this was a common perception. And but what was interesting, though, was people's, I think, in the centenary of commemorations, it allowed people to do their own research, but I think also be more open about their own family members. Uh, and I'm thinking in case of uh, Jerry Cassidy, who grew up, uh, 65 years of age, grew up in the Bogside in Derry uh, during the Troubles, um, and who found out about his own relation, Ned Breslin, who had been responsible, apparently, for the transportation of the prisoners at Bally Seedy. Um, and Jerry was really very open, and he was a great example of somebody, as I said, grasping the nettle of uh, the difficulty of what they found as he's a free state pass. I'd just like to quote Jerry, and he was an example of many people. Um, Jerry says, you hear it all the time, people talking about the old IRA, IRA, about how wonderful they were. And we used to think that ourselves, like we never thought the IRA were involved in any atrocities. We never thought that the IRA were shooting people and burying them secretly. Nobody talked about that part of it. And now that's all coming out through the great work of historians. They're doing, bringing that all into the general public. So we look at Ned now completely different. I look at Ned now completely different in a sense that he was of a time. He lost his friends the night before in an incident that was just as equally as bad as the following day, referring to Balasidi Nakhlegoshal. I don't know if I wanted to research it at the start, to be fair. You know, immediately took the same opinion everybody else did. He was a free stater and look what he's done. But you know, I think once I started getting wee snippets about him, like I never knew he was so close to the War of Independence, we didn't know anything like that. And whenever I grasped the nettle, it wasn't that painful, and maybe it should have been. And as you probably asked me earlier, people would probably sit, st still frown at what I think of him. Um, Jerry was kind of an interesting thing. As I said, there was a lot of people who kind of were willing, um, in some ways, to talk about uh, family histories. Uh, and, and in many ways, I think a lot of the Free State families kind of found this a, a kind of a cathartic thing in a lot of sense, because Liz Gillis once said, in, in a thing, while the anti-treaty may have lost the Civil War, they have definitely won the memorial of it. So I think a lot of Free State family, families involved in Free State found it difficult for years to talk about stuff. And I think, um, I think in the process of making this film, there was a reticence in a lot of ways uh, to engage with the broadcaster. And I haven't encountered this in the last 10 years. I, I don't know whether it's a, a general increasing mistrust of public broadcasters, but for the first time, I had to agree in filmmaking for about three or four interviews that I would show them the cut before it would be, end up in the, in the, uh, the cut and, and to get their approval, which I've never had to do before. It's not a, a proviso that I would generally do. But because we were talking to people who had very you know, hard stories to talk about, I, I agreed to it. But it, it was interesting that the Civil War is still that raw for people um, within communities, um, and particularly in, in rural areas, where I feel like that there was a kind of a sense of they didn't want the laundry washed in public. Um, there was also kind of the, a sense of seeking an imprimatur from family members before they did the interview. So there's a lot of to and fro. So it was, it was really interesting in that respect. Um, 
But uh, often or not, in, as a filmmaker, this is a terrible thing to say, the people who want to talk to you are not the people you want to film <laughs> an awful lot of the time. Uh, it's the people who don't want to be filmed often provide the best um, evidence and the best emotion and, and an arc in a narrative sense. Um, and people, uh, we're going to show you one more clip uh, of Dave Phelan, whose uh, who's grandfather and you know, we talk about the silence. His grandfather very openly talked about his experiences uh, in the Civil War. So I'm just going to show another four-minute clip to give a sense of the type of testimonies that we've been getting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nathan. This is a, a document uh, that was actually captured on uh, Mary Comfort in 1923. Um, and it is obviously would be very invaluable because it's a list of the code words that they would have used. Captured meant at a dance, but if he's gone to the theater, that means he's escaped. Auntie Millie's hens, there's a garrison here. A number of eggs mentioned, the number of soldiers. A drake, there's an armored car with them. A duck, they have a machine gun. Playing hockey is a plan of escape. I'm touching stuff my grandfather touched stuff he kept for a reason. It just increases my admiration of my grandfather because living through those times in the 20s in, in, in Dublin as a wanted man uh, being hunted down, um, I can only just imagine the whole terror of it. This is his permit to carry arms, Superintendent Kinsella, CID, uh, Oriel House, and that's dated June 23. Now, on the other side of it, then, is a, a photograph uh, of my grandfather. My mother was very, very, very um, displeased with me asking my grandfather anything. Go out in the garden with your grandfather, you know, don't be talking about that old stuff, like it's all finished, we, nobody wants to know about it. But I got more and more fascinated with it, and my grandfather um, loved, at that stage, to recount uh, things to me, and as a kid, you know, I thought this was great, like, you know. I do remember him talking to me about Oriel House a lot. It was only in latter years, uh, and through reading his journals and so on, then I began to realize just how, how important and significant a role he had actually played in the intelligence gathering in and around Dublin. That's probably the darkest period that I discovered that my grandfather was involved with, because he was then transferred um, into what was called Oriel House, um, which in effect was almost like a Gestapo headquarters in Dublin. You know, it was a, a particularly um, dreadful place to be taken into for uh, interrogation, and my grandfather being there would have been involved in the interrogations. In Ernie O'Malley's book, he comments about my grandfather and says that, you know, Joe Kinsella was among some of the guys who um, was very handy with his hands when it came to beatings of Republicans in order to get information from them. This was the type of inquisition or type of interrogation that was done at the time. That's what you do, and you do it until you get the result. My father said to me that, oh, he says, like, your grandfather used to love going up to step aside, which would be up in the, in the Dublin mountains. And they would have taken people up there and they would have disappeared them, um, as has happened in, in latter years, you know, in the, in the Sleeve Gullion Mountains and so on. Um, so my father was aware that my grandfather would have been involved in that. He always felt that the Civil War should never have happened. He never, ever, ever um, was apologetic for what he had done during the Civil War. But he had always said, what, what was done was done, and it had to be done, um, and it, it, it wasn't good. I'm absolutely 100% happy about uh, his historical involvement in the Irish state. Um, with the good and the bad. And I'm not, and would never, um, you know, say to somebody whose father was taken in by my grandfather and who was beaten to a pulp, say to him, this was, oh, I think my grandfather was right. 
I actually think my grandfather would have realized that he wasn't right, but he was doing what he felt he had to do. Okay. Um, the documentary isn't solely about Oriel House. There just happen to be the two clips we've picked. There are more than that, but um, I hope that gives a sense of just, you know, uh, very open, very honest, very candid, and Dave was, and there's a whole series of interviews like that that are really important, I think. Um, I mean, for, for historians, the story of a battle or even the date of a battle or an ambush is important, but what we found for our collection of, from memory keepers, it was the result and the aftermath of that ambush that stayed with the family for generations. Uh, and often that silence afterwards was what was most often spoke about. I mean, she, for, in, in talking to her own grandfather, we came across with the sense that there was a generation that didn't want to burden the next generation with what they had experienced. Um, and that, in a sense, we wanted it looked at in a sense that in that gap, almost that what it feel, felt like an amerta almost about the Civil War, what filled that silence? Was it a trauma? Um, an interview in Isolde White, um, granddaughter of Sean McBride, she gave a really interesting quote as to why she felt the need to speak and how important it was. He says, when she said, when you contacted me about this project, I was interested because I think talking to people and giving people space to tell stories and telling stories is one of the ways that we move on from trauma, I think. But yes, it's, it's like a lacuna, isn't it, the Civil War, but it's lived on so palpably and how we live as a country. And yet it hasn't been, it hasn't been talked about specifically. And that, that is the very nature of how trauma is handled by the culture and the people who've been traumatised are left carrying the trauma for everybody else. And, only, and it's only when everybody in that culture and in society were witness to the trauma that the trauma can really actually be integrated and people can move on. And that was the overriding uh, sense of as, uh, making this film and was that there was a great sense of unburdening, I think, uh, and a lot of, uh, I particularly think of a man called Brian Cannon, whose uh, uncle was killed in Chrysler in 1923, and who, as a Free State soldier, and whose uh, killing was then used as an excuse to execute four men being held in Drumbo. And when we interviewed Brian during this, he actually broke down in the telling of it. It's like he'd been carrying the weight of the guilt, what he felt like the guilt of the family for those men's deaths. Uh, and I hope that comes across in the documentary. And we, like, it's one of those interviews where we just do not cut. We let it run fully. And you get the honesty from him, uh, and, we, and we owed him that. And that was kind of a whole sense of uh, the emotion, that I think, from the making of this film. Uh, and just to finish off, we interviewed Jennifer Nuttall, whose uh, grandfather, uh, end up committing suicide because he felt he was being blackmailed by anti-treaty uh, battalion down in New Ross and Wexford. And it was really moving what Jennifer said. She said, after she had given her testimony, uh, she said, it's time that we moved on because it sort of, it did hang over us. We didn't talk about it, but the feeling was there. And yes, it's time that it's over. So like the closing, the cover of a book, it's over, you know, it's over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morris. Um, it's extraordinary to think that two parties to this are in government, isn't it, when you uh, go back or, or what the reception will be when um, 2023 comes about and things get um, revived again. But now it's o over to you. We've got plenty of time for discussion. Um, so if there's a show of hands, we've got Anthony here with the, the microphone. Oh, there's somebody there? Right. Yeah, I'm always a slight problem in the world because the board were a little bit over in 1923, probably the day of the second seat in the Waterford elections. And I asked myself, what were people voting for, or what did they think they were voting for and voting for this woman, who was, you know, just uh, your classic widow in politics? What did Cahill Brewer represent apart from sterile, anglophobic, narrow minded nationalism? And as far as I can see, he didn't represent anything except apart from sterile, anglophobic, extreme nationalism. 
And, you know, it was sort of symbolic in a way that he, he really ends up committing suicide in 1922. You know, maybe he'd have done us all a favour if he'd done it in 1915. Um, thanks, Emmett. I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, so I'm not going to. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> um, I think in some ways um, you're, you're right. Um, he, he does um, represent um, a particular type of nationalism and a particular uh, you know, zealous pursuit of a republic. Precisely what he would have stood for had he lived is difficult to say. Um, but um, he's very close to Eamon de Valera. And um, you know, it, is, it is certainly conceivable uh, that he would have followed de Valera when de Valera broke from, uh, from Fianna Fáil. Now, however, uh, Kathleen, his widow, um, certainly did not make, uh, make that journey. Uh, she was very close uh, to Mary McSweeney, um, eventually broke with Witch and Fane in, in the 1930s. And she was very opposed to how de Valera and Fianna Fáil uh, tr uh, attempted to utilize her, the memory of her husband. Um, and uh, you know, there's a big story ar ar around sort of uh, De Valera's desire to, to kind of match what Common and Whale were doing with uh, a bust of Collins and, and, and Griffith, and she was having none of that. Uh, it wasn't kind of pure enough uh, for for her liking. Schiffer. I just wanted to say, Maris, that that was a pleasure to see some of those clips, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the documentary. And um, I know from my point of view, I'm sure I can speak to anyone else involved. That was a real privilege um, to be involved, and also the care you took in interviewing so many people. I know a lot of people won't actually feature in the documentary, but that the archive will be there anyway. Yeah. Um, I just had a question, I suppose, for, for both of you re relating to that, and maybe to gender what, you, what you've just said. In terms of the, the memory keepers, um, when we look at, let's say, the Brewer family, how have you been able to trace how the children might have reflected back um, on their father? And um, the question, again, of kind of trying to control the narrative, is there a difference maybe in, in how that is um, within the family and outside, outside of the family? And then equally, um, Morris, from your own work in terms of um, the gender dynam dynamics of that, are women more likely to remember certain elements of family history than men? Is that something that came up at all in the, all the interviews you've, mm. you've spent hours going through, I suppose? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to start off? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, it, it, I would say it's just on the Carl Brew, we interviewed Carl Brew's grandson, um, and, and what's, uh, mm. what's really interesting is what came across from him is that uh, was more the legacy of that name and what he had to carry. Um, and how he felt beholden to the name, which was really interesting. We also found out with the grants of, Ar of Erskine Childers, is that sense of um, what was passed on, um, and almost do they become the, 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 the keepers of the flame in a lot of sense, and that the, the pressure that, that comes on them. Um, in, in terms of, I'll be honest, what we found very hard in regards the looking for people. We've interviewed, I, I think now it's over 100 memory keepers we've gathered. Not all will, will make it to the documentary, but the great thing about this is the UCD, the folklore department, is that they will all be transcribed and bubble written down and lodged into the folklore department for future historians to look at, which is really interesting. We found it very hard to get women to talk about, particularly the coming on experience, for some reason. And often it was men that wanted to talk about their grandmothers, which was really interesting. Um, and to be honest with you, it's a kind of one of the disappointing aspects of it was that we found it very hard to find some really great speakers on that. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I think academia might be a better way to explore that in a lot of ways. And I, it is one disappointment I walked away with Schaefer from it, to be honest with you, I thought there would be more. I think we have a lot of people in there talking about gender experience, which is important. Um, but it, it, was, it was a challenge, to be honest with you, to find it, yeah. yeah. Um, very uh, interesting question, um, Shifra. Not, um, I mean, the, in, in answering it in terms of, of the Brewer children, yes, they certainly uh, kind of have to live with the, the, the shadow of, of, of their father and what he represented. At one point, the family considered emigrating to the United States, uh, but they decide that would not really be what uh, Cahill Brewer would have wanted. Um, so uh, some of the children um, 
when they grow up, um, you know, be, become uh, you know quite ardent Republicans. Um, Nonine, who was one of the elder, elder daughters, um, she, you know, she's in turn during the, the the Second World War. The Department of Justice are very they're very mindful of the optics, uh, and they do not want to kind of incarcerate her for for too long. Uh, Ruri, who was the only son, who's named after Roger Casement. Um, he, in his youth, when he was um, 16 or 17, he's arrested uh, for you know, trying to sell Easter lilies. He spends time in the Curragh, and then he gravitates later in his life. Uh, you know, he doesn't have any participation in politics, but then later in his life, uh, he becomes a member of Fianna Fáil and a front bench spokesperson on, uh, on Northern Ireland. Uh, so he, he sort of makes that journey to, to, to Fianna Fáil. And then sort of the, the kids in the middle, uh, no evidence that any that, that any you know public political involvement. But no, no means very active with her mother in Cumannaman, and then later with the split moves of Mary McSweeney to Man Manon and the Publisher, and this does maintain um, which possibly Emmett's description of that um, very narrow zealot, very kind of Republican Sinn Féin, no compromise with anything. And, and doesn't change. Yeah. No, no. How do you think filmmakers die of treated brewers? Do you think that um, kind of contributes to the... I, I, to, to be honest with you, I mean, one of the kind of motivations in writing this book is that we just wanted to present, as all historians are kind of obliged to do, to sort of present a more informed, evidence-based picture. Um, so, so, I mean, people can still have their, have their views, but um, I suppose sometimes hundreds of books have been written on the Irish Revolution. Most of them make a pa passing reference to Brewer without ever really delving into him, him or his position or how his death affected the family. So we wanted to try and address some of, of those issues and then people can make up their own mind beyond that. So, I, I mean, uh, I hope Emmett reads the book and, and <laughs> softens his view, for example. Um, but, and, and you're quite entitled, of course, not to. Um, so we'll see. OK, we've got one, one over there. Then there's several hands over in this. Jim McDermott, uh, just generally, I've enjoyed the standard of, of lectures very, very much. But uh, to Morris, uh, just um, putting this as a couple of almost cliches now, as the reasons why in the North, certainly, uh, there was a reluctance to tell children, grandchildren, and so on, what happened. It's, well, one of the cliches would be that life's lived forward, but it's, it, it's lived forward, but it's only understood backward. Any ideologue that joined an organisation in the North, uh, it made a certain set of assumptions, I suppose, on the Republican side. Num number one, that he could depend on support from the South <coughs> of themselves, the North would have been very weak in relation to unionism, which was setting up specials, giving it support to one side of the community. And as time moved on, that sense of abandonment, the sense of a road taken, not perhaps the right road taken, the complicated nature of uh, Republican involvement, armed Republican involvement in the North, the fact that the Special Powers Act was likely to throw you in the pokey very, very quick if you started writing about, well, I did this and I did that, and some chap in the, in the, the RUC or the B Special says, oh, well, did you? Well, this is what's going to happen, therefore. So there's quite a lot of restrictions why people can say, can say things. Not, Number one, personal, very emotional reasons. Splits in the North, even worse, perhaps. Well, that, that's not true, but anybody that took an anti-treaty side, a brother taking a pro-treaty side, the extra complications in the North. Did you find, Morris, that that came across in your in research? It's, by the way, very good, the clips have seen. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I th look, I think there's a documentary on its own on what, what came across to me is an, as the other civil war going on. Uh, Schaefer was quite right earlier on. It's often perceived as a 26 county uh, when the shakes the barley type, uh, what, that's what the civil war was. What, where we get into the complications of civil war is, is, is first of all, the arms being sent up, uh, the joint campaign in that point before the four courts where there's kind of pro and anti-treaty working together in Tyrone, Derry and Donegal. Um, almost in the Second War, and what came across is that the legacy, I, I suppose the bitterness that still uh, lingers today, 
is that sense of being forgotten when those boundaries were drawn, when that border was drawn, and particularly place in Mullabon, for instance, we talked to people about, there was that bitterness that they ended up outside that free state. And also the added complications obviously were that you couldn't pass on information <laughs> to family members. And, you know, I would have loved to have done more on that. And I actually genuinely think there's, a, there's another documentary in that. And, um, uh, and it, that really was fascinating to me. It opened up and says, oh my God, because we do, as Schaefer said earlier, there is a tendency to look at it as a Southern civil war. And that's something we, we definitely have touched upon and I hope it comes across, yeah. Union. Thanks, Margaret. I'm Eunan Halpin. A couple of points, really, for, 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 for Morris, and it's about this, I read about this in my, the Kevin Barry book, about the idea of women as the kind of, very often the granny as the custodian of memory. As I put, my impression of my two grannies is that they were also the selectors of memory. So, so, so they, as I mentioned before, my, my grandmother, Cathy Barry, simply edited it out in terms of talking to her grandchildren, any reference to her husband's brother, Paddy, who was killed in 1921, because he, he, she didn't, you know, she, there was only room for one icon, as it were, in the house, which is Kevin. Um, and I, I, whether this is a gender dimension or not, I'm not sure, but, but, but as, as sources, when we do find them, people talking, just as we interrogate documents, we have to think about it. I'm not telling you what you don't know. We have to think about well, who's, who's keeping this story and why. And I'm sure you've all, I, I, in terms of my, my father's family in County Down, I, I've stumbled upon bits of stories which, which I never heard scraps of from, from my uncles or aunts, right? But which are very much known locally, right? But, and that's what they, one of the things they know about the Haiti's. Do you see what I mean? So, so, so by law, resources and memory is great, but we have to be careful about the people, the curators, uh, as much as anything. The other point, just a general thing, is, is about uh, 2017, I think it was, I gave a talk at the West Cork History Festival, and afterwards a man came up to me who was really quite, I won't say angry, but a bit upset, because I'd been praising Heather Humphrey's work as minister. And he said two things, he was from Donegal, he said, I'm a Donegal Protestant, and he said, he disagreed completely with, with her approach, but also with the fact that she had said she'd gone into government because she, she, he said she can no longer speak for us. And he remained, uh, and his son wasn't that, he was a guy in his early 30s maybe also, uh, remain extremely, uh, I don't know if bitter is the word, but extremely unhappy at partition. And so, uh, uh, and you mentioned the uh, or whatever, the, the, the border areas. Uh, we, we have to remember there are people uh, in the south, not just in Drum, where Heather, Heather Humphreys is from, but uh, who, who, who still feel it just as much as to, uh, as it were, Republic, Republican families or people in South Armagh or whatever. Okay, sorry, that's more a speech uh, from the doc than it is a question, but it's a comment as well, and I'd like you to respond. Thanks. Yeah, um, yeah you know, thanks, Eunan. Um, I give one, one example, for instance, of a story. We were looking at drum, the Drumbo Martyrs and we were looking at Charlie Daly. Um, and what quickly became apparent to me as a filmmaker and the editor, Mick, was that like, actually the story of the Drumbo Martyrs is fascinating and tragic as it is. What's really interesting is how Charlie is remembered back in Kerry. And on, in Conachulteen, I think is the, the townland where he's from, it's a shrine uh, and absolutely perpetrated by uh, their aunt May who is a very hardline Kerry Republican, who was adamant that Charlie's was a martyr and that he would be remembered always. And that informed the house. And you could sense a division within the, the house of how he was remembered. But so for me, the story, it was the story of the beatification almost of a martyr that was inter that, that, how that history was informed. You contrast that to a family in Listowel, who the two other martyrs, the O'Sullivan and Enright, who are hardly remembered in, in the store because it's seen as a Fine Gael town. And it's that memory of, says, and as, as somebody says, you die twice when you're forgotten. And it's that kind of, within the one county, two very different memories exist from one incident. That's why I say the incident happened in 23, but the repercussions are, are long lasting. I, I hope that um, answers something. Yes. Jeff. Um, uh, a couple of comments and a, and a question um, in relation to Morris's uh, view or, or concern as to 
why there are two different positions really on the civil war today. Uh, I think it's really establishment versus rebel, essentially that the establishment has to answer for or probably were crimes, and they don't want to remember those, so they don't talk about them, they feel guilty about them, but rebels never feel guilty. Essentially, that's the essence of romance and re rebellion. I think that could be the answer. On, 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 on the other point, about, uh, I actually knew Muriel McSweeney, I met her, put it like that, uh, and I was surprised even to learn that she was actually active in the, in the uh, in Dublin in the Civil War, alongside Cahill Brew. Uh, I, I knew her daughter better, Maura McSweeney, and Rory Brew, because whenever I was Secretary of the Irish Association, I ran a conference called Children of the Revolution, which had Maura, Rory, uh, Gareth Fitzgerald, and the daughter of O'Doherty, the Derry MP. Um, and they were a great family, interesting people. And they weren't, they were like, to my mind, they were had the sort of outlook of Michal Martin today, that sort of Fianna Fáil. They, and yet I understand their, uh, one of their children anyway, if not more, are, are, are you'd say, anti-revisionist almost. So it's moved from generation to generation. And just quickly, the last question to, um, on, on Cahill Brewer is, what was his background, early days, who were his parents? Um, he's, it, that's a really interesting uh, question, Jeff. Um, his father was an antique dealer, and I'm not talking sort of um, middle of the road antique dealer. He furnishes uh, uh, the you know <coughs> houses of the very well-to-do. Uh, he has a, a very large warehouse on Ormond Quay, um, and the family are doing really well. They have they have a branch in London, and then uh, he is essentially ripped off. Uh, by his two eldest sons. Uh, so they're organizing uh, an auction uh, of antiques and pictures in Australia. Uh, the proceeds uh, disappear, uh, and this actually uh, plunges the family into poverty. So uh, Brewer um, is in Belvedere College. He's living across the road from it. Um, they have to sell that house. His education is cut short. His sister's education is also cut short. So Brewer sort of, you know, has to grow up relatively quickly, and this kind of um, financial loss has a profound effect on him. So this happens when he's 14. And uh, it explains, at least we think it explains, uh, uh, Brewer's uh, extraordinary um, zealousness around financial uh, propriety and keeping records, even in the murky world of illegal arms smuggling during the War of Independence. And that is a significant issue uh, in his uh, fractious relationship with Michael Collins, that he feels Collins is not keeping uh, a close enough eye on, on where money is going and that he can't account for certain funds. Um, and Brewer himself then, when he, um, you know, he, he wanted to pursue a medical career, he doesn't. Uh, he uh, becomes, um, I suppose, a purveyor of church goods and candles, uh, first for a British company, and then uh, with two brothers called Lawler, they set up their, their, their own company, uh, Lawler's, which is, still, uh, which is still in business. And his sisters um, and his mother, they live with him. And he buys a small shop for, for one of the sisters, and he does his best to, uh, to try and help them financially. Uh, so his generosity to his own family is, uh, is something that is mentioned by, by his descendants, but wouldn't be widely known kind of in the historiography. Um, um, so I'll be talking about similar issues actually later, so I'm not going to say too much, um, but I have done a lot of work around the relationship between uh, memory and trauma, and um, I didn't know your grandmother, you know, she sounds like a fascinating woman, but I agree with you, I think there is a strong degree of uh, selective remembering, and where you have remembering, you also have forgetting, so the t two things, um, you know, exist or coexist side by side. But I have a bigger question, I suppose, uh, which again, I'm grappling with in my own work, and that is, is there a danger, I suppose, in reifying memory to the extent that we don't look critically at things like historical accountability? Brewer, for instance, crops up in a lot of my work on, on the violence women experienced in the Civil War. You know, so is there a danger that actually in prioritizing and reifying memory that you're not looking at questions around historical accountability, around a uh, controversial point of war crimes, and that it becomes another form of description of experience 
lacking that kind of political, theoretical analysis of power and violence that actually really was at the heart of the civil war. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's a, there's a disjuncture there. And I suppose I would really distinguish, I think, between relatives talking about, you know, previous generations in their families as memory uh, and, and how, I suppose, you know, ethically even, you know, the clause that because the relatives are dead, you can ethically talk about this. Whereas, in fact, these are people who are, who are writing about their experience and memory in the present. So that it's really about the present rather than just the past. So I've, I have a lot of questions myself in relation to my own work in relation to this. And I think we need to have, I think, a more critical reflection on how memory is used, how it's gathered, and to not lose sight of what really was at the heart of the Civil War, which is some very difficult, um, you know, difficult events, uh, which need to be looked at in their own right. Yeah, I think Linda's question is really uh, challenging and profound and, and um, I think we'll have to be the last one. So I'm just giving both panellists time to have, think for a second about, uh, about your question. All right, and um, whoever wants to, to go first. Um, I, I couldn't agree more, Linda. I think we have to be very uh, sensitive and very careful and very balanced in how we look at ideally a range uh, of, of source material. And I suppose one way of looking at it maybe is that um, you know, over the coming years that we might achieve maybe perhaps a better sense of balance where um, sort of using kind of uh, folkloric sources um, will be more, more effectively integrated into kind of the documentary uh, or the pictorial record. Um, but I, I, I guess with, with all sources, whether it's uh, military service pension applications or bureau, uh, none of them on their own uh, deserve to be kind of exalted. They, they all have to be very carefully inter uh, interrogated. And I guess the historian's craft is about being a doubting Thomas and to question uh, and continue to question um, and you know, look for evidence uh, from uh, as wide a variety of sources as possible, including memory. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree with you, Linda. I mean, I think we got. I, I think what we've done, for instance, in this, I mean, and I think you have to take it at face value. This is not a documentation of the Civil War, and we're not setting out to do that. For instance, uh, it's a complement, in a lot of ways, to possibly what the other documentary might do is a, is a blow-by-blow -blow account. Uh, and I do agree, we have to be absolutely careful in saying this is not. This is the present perception of what happened in the Civil War. It, 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 it is in the moment. It's not categorically saying this is what happened or people should have done this or people should have felt that. It's what's felt now that's, that's important. I mean, that's what we're doing. So I think, it, but it has its place. Um, and I, I, particularly, I think, in because the Civil War is in the centenary, commemoration of centenary, it, this is the difficult one. This is the thorny one to grasp uh, in a lot of ways for people. Um, and it's really just providing a space, I suppose, that these me memory keepers and the oral histories that we collect now, they're really just complementing you know, the deeper history that's there, I think. That they have to work hand in hand, I think. And that's, um, but there's a big responsibility there, absolutely. And we're, we're consciously aware of that in the making of that film, you know, that we're, we're not being, this is the answer, that this should complement something else in the work of historians. And, and you know, a sense of, the, that's, that's what we do, this project is about putting on paper into the, into the folklore department for historians to go research and look at and discount or take on board. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, the speakers, and thank you all for your questions. And I have a feeling that some of these issues will be uh, returned to this afternoon. But can we just thank our speakers now? <laughs> It's a very good session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Morris.